to... So, okay, great. Um, uh, and of those who haven't completed a higher degree yet, anyone who's really definitely interested in pursuing a career in academia? Okay, great. Thank you for that. That gives me just a sense of we're all differently positioned, which I think is really useful uh, to hear different experiences. So today I've structured it in four parts, but as I say, we'll see, we'll see how we, we go. The first part is uh, about learning, so learning to become an academic. The second, I just don't know whether to call it surviving or thriving, or <laughs> from surviving to thriving, or it's either of those or both. Um, so that's, you know, it's being an academic. Um, the third is uh, about deciding or leaving, so I'll just that will be brief. I'll just pass on to you some of what I've learned from talking to people who've left or, or active, made an active choice not to pursue uh, an academic position. Uh, and then uh, the fourth part would be a, a much more general discussion. But I'm hoping we'll have discussion points we'll, we'll, along, along the way. And just a final word about um, the sort of sensibility uh, throughout this, I guess. I'm trying to strike a balance between a couple of different things. Um, firstly, it's really important to recognise that there are um, very different kinds of predicaments for people in different circumstances and really boldly put for people on casual or sessional work or short-term contracts there's a particular um, set of dilemmas and difficulties and predicaments and for people on continuing contracts there's a different set about work intensification so they are two sides of the same coin and um, we're striking a balance between recognizing and also I, I understand that people who are searching very hard for a full-time academic position don't always find it easy to hear people who have one talking about how difficult it is. So <laughs> I fully understand that. A lot of my interviewees told me that. I see it in my daily life. But it is part of the broader predicament that we're all in. Um, so that's one sort of balance that we're striking. And the second is a, um, another recognising two contradictory imperatives. Um, we're all, uh, all of us, I'm assuming, very literate with critiques of the contemporary ac uh, academic world, critiques of neoliberalism, critiques of corporatisation, and it's really important that we continue to make them. Um, on the other hand, we also want to live well in the system that we're in. So when we're going to be talking about strategies for coping or whatever, it, they're not to be understood as being completely contained within the neoliberal, you know, you're an individual, get out there and cope. But, you know, nor can we not cope. Uh, so that's where the leaving material is interesting because it's, it's about people who are going, you know what, not for me, or, you know, yes, I'm making a commitment and this is how I'll make it livable. So they're the things I'm trying to hold in balance. Okay, so I'm going to just say some things about learning now to be an academic and then after I've made my little uh, preface, um, prefatory remarks, we'll do some um, workshops about, you know, learning academic roles. So I did a small piece of research on this a number of years ago. It was this very small set of focus groups with early career researchers and postgrads on what they thought the academic, the academic role was and how they thought they were being prepared for it. How did they think they were learning? Um, and what I found firstly was that there wasn't a strong understanding of the role. It was one of those things that a con much of a continuing academic's work is invisible. It's, a lot of it's very private or it's very fragmented. It can take place in multiple locations. And so it wasn't very visible to people who were employed as, uh, who were engaged as postgraduates. It became a little more visible when they began teaching. But even then, uh, there were whole aspects of the role that weren't visible to people. The second thing that was obvious from the research is that the very old, uh, indeed ancient, acculturation model was still the dominant model of how people were learning the business. Uh, it's the master-apprentice model um, with, uh, um, and a kind of osmotic model of transmission. And you won't be surprised to know that um, things that are learned when masters hand things down mm -hmm. to students or disciples are gendered and racialised and nepotistic and hierarchical and so on. But they also uh, have bonds and duty and loyalty and commitment and so on. So it, it's a flawed model. Also one that I think has the potential to be infantilising. And in the, the focus groups, it was interesting how many people spontaneously used the metaphor of the child. And I was just going to read you what one of them said. They talked about, you know, I'm taking baby steps or, you know, so on. And one of them, I really loved this because she said, I feel like the little kid at the dinner table. I'm sitting at the smaller table and I don't know when I'm allowed <laughs> to join the bigger table. 
I don't know when I'm allowed to go to the bigger table. And then I don't think I'm ever going to be ready to get to the bigger table. I'm just like, oh, I want to sit here on my plastic chair with my Disney colouring and watch them. <laughs> so I thought that was just a lovely way. And it wasn't an isolated one about pe feeling like a child because of this particular model of, um, uh, of acculturation. And, of course, as the university is changing its institutional form and becoming more like a corporation in some ways, more like a big bureaucracy in others, it's trying to do something about that acculturation model and sort of but in a supplementary fashion, as far as I can see, a kind of professional training um, I idea, but it's not a systematic learning of the craft. It's the offering of little snippets of training. Mm -hmm. uh, you, usually the first ones that come our way are about also involved in the university's own risk management and brand management. So you'll do research ethics training and online mm -hmm. modules or uh, <laughs> work health and safety and, and so on, those, those kind of online modules uh, as a postgrad. So, but of course, as we can see, by, by today, a lot of universities are also experimenting with being um, more supportive of early career researchers and postgrads and or, uh, a richer kind of cohort building. And today's, uh, you know, the series of which this is a part is obviously part of that kind of an endeavour to create a sense of cohort to um, foster intellectual generosity and so on. Um, I did try to get a sense of what the actual techniques, if you like, learning and te teaching techniques of osmosis are, you know, because everyone says, oh, well, you know, you just learn it by inhabiting it. And so, you know, what is osmosis? And as far as I could tell from the small number of people I spoke to, a very big role for observation, a lot of very careful observation and judgment and emulation, a lot of trial and error. Mm. Um, a, a lot of quite conscious watching of academics that people did or didn't like or liked this aspect of what they did and an attempt to emulate <coughs> selective emulation of things that you'd seen that you liked and so on. And therefore a very big role for the postgraduates uh, among themselves, a kind of uh, older sibling, younger sibling relationships uh, within postgraduate cohorts where they existed in big enough numbers. And, of course, a really big role for gossip, <laughs> you know, postgrad gossip, you know, chatting. I mean, oh, can you believe they did that? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, you'll never guess what so-and-so did. All of that, you know, very, that's obviously a part of the everyday pedagogies of how we learn to be academics. <laughs> so um, I guess all I would do if I were doing the research uh, again, apart from doing more of it more systematically, is I would have probably... <clears throat> problematized from the outset the very idea of well actually what is an academic like so is a um, person in senior management who has a PhD in their disciplinary field but has never worked there are they an academic mm -hmm. is a vice chancellor who worked their way up through the ranks but now doesn't do any teaching or research are they an academic I think uh, not only is the <laughs> academic role diverse uh, in different stages of careers and in different national systems and whether one's a teaching or a research or whatever, but actually that the line between management, uh, uh, administrative staff, support staff and academics is, is complex. So I think that question of, you know, what even is an academic would have been more problematised if I were doing the work today. So um, what I'd like to do now then is to um, just to try to think on a really nitty-gritty level uh, about what academics actually do. And, and that's based on that research where it was surprising how little people who were, you know, had been in the postgrad system for a number of years, in fact, some had finished their degree, but uh, they didn't know fully all the kind of things that somebody who has a continuing academic role might have. Um, so I'm not sure, I had, I wasn't quite sure how you do participation in multiple locations without people coordinating it there. Um, and I do, I do like to do things where you write things down and talk and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, but I can see some people are in, in uh, uh, rooms on their own, others are in rooms with groups of people. So we're just going to do whatever works best for you. Um, and what I have, I can put it on the screen for those who can't see it. But I have a couple of handouts, and I'll just find out who's actually been, um, been given them. We sent them to other campuses, but they may or may not have made their way to you. Um, uh, and I, they were going to go on a website for downloading, but that, that may or may not have happened. 
So um, let's have a little look at, um, we have a, one that's um, a table, it's an empty table. Uh, what's it called? It's called Activity One, the academic <laughs> role. There we go. Um, so can I get a show, so it, I don't know, I'll show you on the screen what it looks like and we'll see who's got it. And if not, there are, of course, other ways we can do this. So, um, now, have I shared screen? No, I have to do that. Before I put that up, is that correct? To share the screen? Yep. I'll go back to... Hopefully I'm not switching this entire thing off. <laughs> uh, okay. We're looking for share screen. There it is. Oh, the green one. Hooray! And do that, I go share screen. Ah, oh, there we go. Can you see? Yes. Oh. Now, I have no idea if that's big enough for, I don't know. So can I first see who's got that in hard copy? Can I get a show of hands? Oh, good. Pretty much everyone. Wow. Excellent. Someone, Marcel, thank you, people. Thanks, <laughs> Melanie. <laughs> Thanks, Melanie. <laughs> All those people who must have made that miracle happen. Thank you. Um, so if you don't have that, you can all at least see or from where you are? See what it is? Okay. I'll, and if not, it doesn't matter. We can just talk you through a basic version of it. So what I wanted to do, if you're in a room with other people and would like to do this, then do it in pairs or in little groups. If you're on your own, no problems whatsoever. And um, don't try to do this in any kind of order, just completely randomly. I'd like you to write down the things that, you think somebody in a, in a continuing early-ish to mid stages of a continuing academic role who does both teaching and research some of the things they might do and be, be small like you know write book reviews um, uh, make course outlines like a whole lot of really small things and what I'd like you to do with those is to think well do they belong to teaching research admin um, service to the discipline service to the community service to the university and then to have a, you can rate it in whatever rating system you like about how well equipped you feel to do those jobs that you've listed from um, through, yeah, it, that's all fine, through to I have no idea, I've never done video conferencing before. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the column under training, to have a think about, well, okay, for those things that you don't think you know much or that you'd like to learn even more about, what do you think is available to you? to um, both formal and informal things, like from gossip through to an online training module or lynda.com. Like, what do you think is available to you as a training mechanism? So we'll take, I don't know, at, um, at least five, five or some randomly chosen number, like eight minutes to um, <laughs> write down a whole list. But do it at the kind of micro level and just put next to it T for teaching, R for research, A for admin, and so on. And do it solo or with others as you choose. We might, we might um, re regroup. I'd like to just start by hearing um, some uh, preliminary feedback about, about what you've written down, or I guess more about what you've learnt by writing that down. Whether you, there were all sorts of things that you found yourself thinking of that maybe uh, were or weren't the same as people next to you if you're in a group, or um, whether you decided that you're got a lot to learn, whether you thought there was a lot of training or help or informal help available, just some preliminary feedback and then we'll uh, drill down a bit more by hearing about individual things that you've listed and noted. Anyone like to kick us off? I'm trying to keep my eyes on the screen. <laughs> What's the signal? If, if you know? are on another campus, if you can just sort of wave yes, violently. <laughs> quite little. <laughs> Does somebody from Otago want to kick off, maybe? Yeah, let's just start somebody in the room here and just any, any preliminary feedback? Just um, all, all of the myriad of small tasks that can prevent you from reaching your PBR, PBRF goals because there's so much coming at people all the time, but they also have to be maintain that writing um, part of their job. So a, a real tension between a proliferation of everyday um, jobs and these kind of longer term big things like writing stuff, for example, or applying for grants. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Can you unshare that one, I think, is what they say. 
what's that? The chat just came up to say to unshare the, so that they can see us again. Oh, oh. oh okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I really am very unpracticed at this. Yeah. <laughs> it's top of my list of how to train while well, learning on the job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's what we do. The, the trial and error <laughs> method and relying on the wisdom of people around me. Thank you, whoever sent that. Thank you, <laughs> Katrina. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, so we're talking about the there's a tension between this proliferation of daily stuff and um, much work that has a much different temporality. So these conflicting temporalities of academic life I think are really important that, you know, uh, if you're wanting to work on a, a thesis or a book or some, a research project, it may have a three or four year timeline, but you're also juggling things that are this constant barrage of different weekly timelines, instant <coughs> ones and so on. So managing different temporalities I think is a, an extremely uh, difficult part of um, uh, academic work. Um, in the, what else would some feedback be for people? Uh, there's a question there, Waikato. Hi. Hi. Um, we were starting off by thinking about the teaching responsibilities and um, both talked about how um, deal, dealing with some of the perhaps less formal aspects of teaching can be mm. quite time consuming and so meeting with students um, the admin side of using um, platforms like Moodle can really suck up a, a lot of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of, uh, I guess, different forms of invisible labour there too, aren't there? There's software learning, um, yeah. uh, which is usually... Uh, do, when, when you've had a variety of softwares to learn, everyone, do you go to courses do you just learn by trying it yourself because you haven't got the time to go to a course to learn it or is it not offered to you as a sessional person where you could do a course what are people's uh, experiences of learning uh, software um, from our point of view we um, learn on the fly but um, <laughs> the university has also just recently set up um, e tutes which are students uh, mainly grad postgrad students who are schooled in a particular platform and they work with other students who are tutoring and staff um, to help them with things like Moodle. Fantastic. So are they more are they videos or are they live tutorials? Um, no, you can actually make an appointment and have them come and walk you through something if you need to do something in particular. It's yeah, quite good. Fantastic. Because often with uh, people, it's, it, there's that tension between should I set aside if a workshop's at a particular time, coming in on a day you might otherwise be trying to work at home just to do the workshop to learn this. It's easy to say, oh, no, no, I'll just try to wing it and so on. Mm. Um, the other part of the labour you were talking about is the labour, the human labour of talking uh, with students, uh, maybe with colleagues, the kind of mentoring labour. There's a lot of that um, very welcome labour because it's at the heart of what we want to be doing, but it's also often in, invisible. I think also just on, on the, the teaching front, I mean, this is obviously a big part of um, what we do as, as academics. There seems to just be an assumption that if you've got a PhD, you can teach, <laughs> you know, and, and knowing your subject is not the same as being able to teach it well. And, um, and I think there's also an assumption of, teaching is very homogenous it, it's you know teaching a big group of over 100 students is very different from from doing a tutor or doing a postgraduate class but there doesn't seem to be I, mean, I know our um higher education development center does run some workshops but again it's the learning on the fly you just expect to slip into these different modes of teaching different sizes of groups different year levels and it's not actually i mean you know academics don't actually get taught how to teach Mm -hmm. And it's the same in terms of designing courses, um, you know, and designing assessments and, and all of those sorts of things and thinking about, you know, what is it you want your students to learn and um, how do you actually translate that into course material and then, you know, and there is very little, it is, you know, I, I know that I started at Vic and I went to a few different courses that were run there, but they were very generalist mm -hmm. um, and I had some really good mentoring as well, which was really, really helpful. So, again, it's that soft labour that goes in um, being in an environment where you've got that collegial support to help you in those early phases. But I think one of the things I was thinking of um, 
and it was when you were sharing your experiences of what people's uh, experiences were with your research was that I'm relying a lot on my own undergraduate experience yeah. as well as mm. this huge resource of like oh yeah I remember what it felt like to be a first year Mm. who'd been out the night before and like it's not you know, or whatever it might like whatever it might be trying to get under the skin of of, of the experiences they're going on but it's, don't it's, ever lose that yeah it's <laughs> it's really it's, it's, it's nothing worse than an academic lecture that's dissociated with real life yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got i think somebody that i might just add to i've Someone just become like, a student last week i've enrolled at a postgrad <laughs> degree at my own university i'm engaging with a student admin from a student's point of view, <laughs> I mean, and I've just had some difficult circumstances <laughs> in my life and I'm thinking I might be applying for special consideration. And it's <laughs> but it's actually really useful uh, yeah. in that same vein yeah, yeah. Yeah, to so be reminded. From, there's a question yeah. at Burke, Marcel. Yes, hi, Marcella. Marcella from <laughs> Geography. Um, so, yeah, I, I can, I totally, you know, make, make sense this thing of, of remembering when you, well, then that's also applies for supervision, which is even more tricky because it was one or two people, right, that really shape how you understand supervision and how to. Mm -hmm. um, and also feeling very grateful for all my teachers, even though I might, hate, I might have hated them at the time. You know? <laughs> Realize that there is a lot of work, actually, even if I didn't like what they were doing. But, um, for me, it's been about this thing about teaching. When I started teaching here, we got like five years ago, I was just shocked by the level of training I was offered and kind of pressure to go on things like applying for a master's and basic grant applications, you know, lots. But when I was trying to get anybody to help me, for instance, with my teaching in particular, I was asking explicitly to work through my accent, you know, because I was teaching large classes. There was nothing. So I, I ended up, like, go to this person, go to this person. And at the end, they say, oh, maybe you should pay, pay somebody. There are people who do those kind of things. Like, okay, no, I'm not paying <laughs> my job, you know. But, but there's just this. And then also, I'm there things like Center of Academic Development that helps with course preparation and whatever. But it's very ad hoc and it's very kind of uh, limited. It's not like you are really supported to think through things, you know, throughout the process. But all the things that have been implemented here, like the new online system to upload the information and your assessment. So there's effort putting into that, but it's always more from a surveillance point of view mm. rather than a nurturing point of view, rather mm. than a space to allow you to think and process and improve. And now yeah, you submit some, something, somebody in the faculty, <laughs> probably an administrative, you know, will click it or not, and if you want to change it, big problem, because you have to go through, but I mean, I'm trying this out, it might not work, you know, I'm one, I want to make it better, but it's a big deal now, to, so it's, yeah, it's really frustrating. Yeah. I think that there's a really interesting point about the changing um, understanding of pedagogy, uh, when you're saying about trying things out, I mean, a, a, a traditional understanding of learning is, is this mutual process, where there's errors, it's made, it's fallible, you learn, you learn together, and I think that conception of pedagogy as this ongoing kind of developmental thing in which you, it, there's a lot of lip service paid to it, you know, like because mm. if you go for a teaching grant or something, it has to be said learning and teaching and I learn from my students and so on. Like you have to, there, but often as rhetorical gestures mm -hmm. um, and students themselves, I guess, are not coming in with the same understanding of education as this kind of uh, flawed, or, or there's a particular, that's at risk, I suppose, by the corporatisation. And when you're paying really big fees for um, courses and so on, you want, you know, a, a product. You want that product that's been got right, you know, <laughs> before that. So it, it's it's a complex. It's bound up, I think, in the corporatisation of universities, the changing understanding of what pedagogy is, the very reasonable expectation on students' part that if they're paying a lot of money, they want something good and so on. Yeah. Um, I wondered if... Uh, I could show you the one I prepared earlier, my little list, which will, of course, be different because it's different in different stages of career. Uh, Katrina, um, would you like me to read out your chat or can everyone see that? What would you... Or, or do you want to read it out? Unmute yourself and... No? <laughs> <laughs> so, but you're happy for... Um, said to everyone here this is so interesting my field is education and like Ruth I used to be a school teacher 
So I feel like I come more equipped than some academics in terms of pedagogical knowledge. But I have this sense that I'll need to suspend my skills and knowledge from school spheres and relearn how things are done at tertiary level, course design, resource preparation, teaching, etc. Setting aside the expertise and going back to the kids' table. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm hopeful for you. I think actually it's, uh, you, you know, I've thought a lot about, as you know, the kind of feeling of being an imposter. And I think actually having been formally trained in at least one thing, whether it's software, whether it's pedagogy, whether it's, you know, grant application writing from a professional field, it, it, it's good to feel like properly trained in one thing. <laughs> <laughs> at least and I, you know because I'll show you my list it's like man how would anyone expect people to be good at all these things once we look at it so this list is not designed to be daunting it's designed to be therapeutic when you write down what actually people do it's like okay well why would you expect to feel good at this so um for a moment I I'll just un can ha has anyone got the long list I prepared earlier or more simply is there anyone who hasn't who can't see it Okay, that's great, in which case I won't bother putting it up on the, the screen and we can still all see each other. So here's this, you know, in inverted commas, typical early to mid-career list, which means, you know, stuff that I thought of um, uh, myself in several train trips on my way to and from work. I just go, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, we do this. Oh, yeah, we do that. And another job would come in. Oh, yeah. So it's that kind of a list. I just welcome some discussion about now about your list and this list and the question of training, of competence, of uh, how you might learn it uh, and so on. Really taking anything you like out of this list and seeing where it takes us. And out of your lists, of course. I think the first thing that looms in, in terms of my own position as a PhD student is this word grant <laughs> and just this knowing that it, and this fear that as soon as I perhaps get a job after this PhD is done, I, I'll have to spend a lot of energy defending the right to keep it <laughs> and, to, you know, kind of to, to perpetuate mm. that experience. And I, yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I don't know what it, what it looks like. I don't know how it feels apart from feeling insecure. That's all I, that's the only experience of grants I have. Mm. So that's, it's, it's quite curious kind of just thinking, you know, it's, it's the, fir the, fir the first thing on, on your list about teaching is, is, is applying for the right to be paid to teach. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a really interesting way. Of, and it's number two on research. So like, yeah. Oh, I should say um, okay. applying for a teaching grant. That one is not uh, to, so much to be allowed to teach, but uh, for innovations, it, that is a place for innovations, experiments, pilot studies yeah. and so on. So that's an okay. sort of optimising thing. It's not, a, it's not like, a, oh, if you don't get money to, you, you can't. You've lost your jobs. Sort of yeah, yeah. But I think from my experience, actually sitting with that discomfort of always needing to seek or apply for a grant is just part of being an academic. Yeah. You know, it's just that constant looking out and seeing it. And, and I think once you're in the, I say privileged, I'm thinking of your talk yesterday, <laughs> position of being tenured or being in a confirmed position, um, you still have to keep looking and keep applying. And it's part of maintaining that position for sure. But it's, there's less pressure than if you're actually on soft money and you have to constantly have it in order to just do the work. Yeah. Yeah. So I think some of those uncertainties perpetuate mm. and they don't actually necessarily go away. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just, it raises that interesting question that it's up to the individual um, t staff member who teaches for, for them to go and seek those funds. Like, I don't know, you'd imagine that there'd be central funds for... So when people have a request for whatever teaching um, technology or whatever else they want to introduce into the thing, that it's um, that they can apply, that the university has funding available for this, that it's not up to the individual member to seek money mm. or to find money to do that work. So it's just, it's that sort of flipping it back over onto the individual to to earn or to to get the money to to do the teaching activities. The interesting one for me is read stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's just you know, for, and and that's it. it I, I had that on my own list, um, and in terms of the frequency, you know, it's one of those things that should happen very often. But um, you know, where do you find the time to keep on top of your field, whether it's for your own reading or for your own research or 
or for your teaching. And I think that's one of the biggest struggles that, that I have um, is finding the time to keep on top of the field. And I find it's, you know, uh, it's only when I'm on research and study leave that I actually feel like I, I have mm. time to think and read mm. when in fact that should be part of the daily existence of an academic. But in capital letters, I have meetings and admin, mm. which is really what I'm spending the time doing. I, you would be surprised how late in the piece of jotting down these ideas, was it about the third iteration that I remembered? Oh, yeah, that's right. And it was a really late inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite interested there wasn't actually research written under research. Ah, true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have this, this tension in that, you know, there's pressures now to have not one article or two articles, but five, six, seven articles published a year, as well as teaching and service and admin. And I hate to say it, but I looked at this and I went, oh my goodness, I've done all of these things this year. Um, but then to actually do the research, mm. to write five or six, seven, eight articles about, unless you're writing review articles or the same thing five, six, seven or eight times. Or working in big teams. Or seriously. working in big teams and doing very minuscule contributions. Um, yeah, it's really hard to, to find the time to... I, I am um, on a confirmation path, so I have a full-time academic job and I work a lot with postdocs who just do research and... I mean, they're, they're my colleagues, they're people I went to university with, and we're always having this tension of, why haven't you done this yet? Well, let me tell you about all the other things my day fills with. I'm not dedicated to one project like you guys are, that beautiful mm -hmm. sacred time of that postdoc where you can just research and publish and research and publish. So it's Yeah, a, you must have to work hard to refrain yourselves from saying, these are the best years of your life. <laughs> <laughs> it's also not in many ways because you're in that no. postdoc game of, no, no, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you know. But it's a system well, that creates that I've got it tougher than, you know, this yeah, is, yeah. like you were saying before, the tension with the people who've now got their job and the people who don't have a permanent position sort of saying, I don't want to hear about your issues, at least yeah. you've got a job sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it creates an environment where people are it, it, resentful of each other, I think, unfortunately. So there's just a got question coming in. Uh, from Peter. Uh, Peter very Do you want to read it out? Where's Peter? Uh, I think he's on, he might be by telephone. Okay, so that, I'll read that out. Is that what we do? Yep. Um, so this is from Peter to everyone. Speaking as a very, and he's, oh, or you can all see this, can you? Everyone can see it already? See, yeah, speaking as a very mature postgrad student who took careful note of all the various teaching methods of all the undergrad teaching staff, my opinion is that the old talk and chalk lecturing and expecting students to write it all down in notes and somehow absorb it all, it's a very inadequate model. <laughs> the courses that I did best in and felt really engaged in were the ones that use innovative teaching methodology, group activities and so on, uh, using Prezi for each student to take turns at making presentations. My pet hate as a distance learning student, the lecturers who made a very poor quality audio recording of their lectures, stuck them up on the class web page and that was all we had, totally inadequate. Mm. Thanks for that, um, Peter. It, it, there's so many sides to that predicament, aren't there? That the, um, as a student hoping for and expecting rightly for something much better than that, um, particularly, I guess, the big transition in universities over the last few decades were to become m much better at teaching, but there's a plenty of residue of people who were in under an, another system where teaching was a bit of an afterthought and, mm. and so on, and they take, there's a bit of a legacy uh, while some of those people... Um, work their way out of the system and, and so on, I guess. I think, I think it's very true. I wondered if I could say something encouraging about grants. Um, <laughs> Sorry. A therapeutic story. A therapeutic story, which is um, I've never got one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing big and external. I've tried a few times, demoralising. Um, and... I say this not as an active recommendation to people as a career strategy don't get any good grants, but to say um, a few things, that there are bits and pieces of funding that can be found easily internally, particularly when you're starting up. If you're lucky enough, I shouldn't keep saying that, but when you get a, 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 an academic job, the moment of, of uh, when you're offered one, don't fall over yourself in gratitude. Remember that this is the only moment they will treat you 
better at that moment than at any other time and start asking about, is there some small startup research funding? It's a not uncommon thing. And it's surprising how much you can do. I, everything I've done has been done on, on a $10,000-y type grants. Mm. I, um, when I got the job that I currently inhabit, I was uh, three weeks away from having a baby and uh, I bargained myself into being able to go part-time and I just knew I had to consolidate. I didn't have summers to spend putting in grant applications that might not be successful. So I just went solo, went focused, went, right, this is what I can do and so on. Uh, and I, I figured that in the summer I could write and read and stuff in a way and I, I, if I'd written a whole grant application, it might come to nothing. So there are choices you can make. I think collaborating with others is a really good one. It's a really important mentoring strategy of more established academics too. Are working on teams, looking for small bits of funding. Don't try to crack the big time straight away. Um, if there's an explicit sense of really strong pressure on you from the beginning, then team up with somebody uh, senior. Don't feel you have to play every game simultaneously and win every game from the start. And you would be surprised there are small internal bits of funding that are reasonably readily available at most places at, at startup. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd just add to that a little bit, coming from um, particularly an Otago perspective, and I think it was the same at Vic, but that's my two experiences of academia in New Zealand, um, and that is that um, to be seen to be applying externally occasionally is strategic. So while I totally endorse um, Ruth's approach because it's my own <laughs> as well, um, um, I would also occasionally choose particular um, external grants that you can apply to that um, uh, show that you are playing the game in effect. And, um, but do it strategically so that, you know, your application can actually form the basis of maybe two smaller grants that you work towards as well. So you can still do the research even if the funding for that doesn't come off, but you pass the letter differently. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. The reference to game playing reminds me that we might move on because we're going to talk about playing the game. And I want to talk um, uh, about ways we can do this with kind of ethics and authenticity but still with a recognition that you know you have to play the games that are offered so thank you so far my own summation then on that learning what i arrived at after doing my own list was that there was a vast array of jobs and required skill little formal training though not training's not unavailable but it, you have to seek it out and you have to have time for it and I thought that that combination is a recipe for feeling overwhelmed and fraudulent and that that's just something I just think we just talk about as this is how it is and not internalise as individual uh, failings because they're not, they're not. So I think we just have to really normalise that and go, this is a structural thing. The second thing that I came at from writing this list was it made me remember again how some parts of academic labour are very public, extremely public, and other parts are very uh, private and unseen. And my suggestions about what to do with gaps in knowledge or skills or training were, you know, where you can and where you want to focus. You can't do everything. So to sort of craft a sense of what your pathway is and seek training, formal training where it's possible. Um, my second strategy is to collaborate with others, to learn from others, to share the labour of learning. My third would be to do as people already do, which is to observe others reflexively and knowingly and thoughtfully, which is, again, also from like what Peter was saying about thinking about his own former lecturers. Um, my, my fourth would be to seek mentoring overtly and specifically. Ask for mentoring from people that you um, really value. Sometimes when you're busy and flustered, it never occurs to you to offer things to people, but you'd be quite happy to do it if you're asked. So, you know, don't, don't be shy about asking. Um, and the final one is to accept your limitations. Here we're verging on the edge of therapy, aren't we? But <laughs> that I, I want to um, say, and to learn to craft a sense of your own academic persona, um, both for your own sanity, but also for public dissemination. You're constantly required as an academic to give an account of yourself in so many different ways. We're always being asked to produce a kind of narrative of our professional self, both tacit and explicit. 
and of our trajectory, whether that's in job applications, grant applications, uh, biogs on publications, any number of forums, we, we begin by giving an account of ourselves and our trajectory. <coughs> Um, all these kind of genres, performance reviews and so on, require this of us. Um, so I think what you can do is to use this as a way of coming to terms with your version of being an academic, your own particular brand, and um, um, sometimes other people are very helpful in that. It's sometimes it's really hard to see the wood for the trees and you can ask other people, well, how do, what do you see all these different bits of what I'm doing as having in common or what do you see that I could work on or where I could go next? I think other people are really helpful. You can't see it yourself. And to, so to keep asking the question, what is distinctive and valuable about the way I am or could be an academic? Not the question, am I good enough? Can I do all this stuff? But what kind of academic am I? And how can I enhance what I already see myself as doing? Uh, and then accept that. Uh, I had a performance review just before I came here and my lovely colleague, when I'd, the review asks you to look for obstacles and difficulties. So it produces a narrative of like, oh, well, I can't do this, that and the other. <laughs> I've got too many things going on research wise, blah, blah, blah. I, I wrote down in this thing, I've got all these different projects. They're all on different things. And she said to me, in a, a one-liner, she said, why are you antagonistic to your own form? <laughs> <gasps> wow. Okay. Because she said, this is what you do. There must be something that makes it cohere. Why do you keep fighting that? And I said, do you take credit cards? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's that cheapest one-line therapy you're ever going to get. So I share it with you. <laughs> but it's, it's very much about that sense of like, yeah, we can't all be all things. So work out what you want to be. Work out what you can be. Work out what you need to know to keep growing that version of being an academic. And follow that down. And don't, don't try to tick every one of those things off the list. Or when you know you're hopeless at something, go, oh, I need to team up with someone on that. This is just not my thing. No. So we're going to talk about, let's be optimistic, call it um, thriving as an academic. And I'll say a few very brief uh, words because I don't think any of us need to spend too much time hearing about the, um, ah, Emily's going to a meeting. Oh, where's Emily? Maybe already gone. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, it doesn't help any of us to enumerate the classic critiques of academic labour. We, we can do that. We know that. We can see it. So I don't want to spend time on that um, really at all. Um, oh, I think I want to talk uh, more about how we can live as well as we possibly can through the system that we're in at the moment. Uh, and as I said at the outset, want us to keep contradictory perspectives alive simultaneously. Uh, how we can do really well without pretending that what we're doing is just buying into a complete neoliberal rhetoric about coping and so on. So there are spaces for resistance and critique, but we've also got to live the life we're choosing to lead. So, lead, lead. so um, how you manage that, I think, is a, a personal challenge, that coping without capitulating. I think it's a, a, a personal challenge and I think it's a conceptual and a political challenge. But for the moment, we're just going to focus on how we might do well and suspend the question of critique. So um, this is uh, where, again, if you're with other people and would like to do it in uh, partners uh, or a small group, then do it together. But if you're flying solo, then um, that's fine too. What I want to start off is to get you, as a small group or as solo, to... Um, list some of the traps or pitfalls or difficulties of academic life that you have observed or experienced. And we won't spend too much time on it, but we'll start by listing some of them um, uh, now. So just a, f just a few moments. So just share briefly with people or write down whatever works well for you. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, what, I, what I'd like us to do then... <coughs> me, is to um, workshops and strategies around either some of the things that you've listed yourself or um, I did also wonder, I, I produced a little list in order that we might have a shared basis for discussion too, so I'm happy for it to go either way. But I was thinking about this is, um, you know, you can think about how do we mitigate problems, how do we work against problems, but we can also think more uh, positively as well, how can we cultivate you know, good, joyful practice as well. 
So um, on the handout for uh, the, the activity two, then, the second part of it, I, that's why I've structured it this way about two problems that I think are really typical problems. Uh, two dangerous games, I've called them, two double-edged swords, mm -hmm. and then thinking positively, well, two things that we might want to really work to try to create uh, around us. And so I, I thought we might, um, perhaps it might be easiest if we can, uh, again, just take just a couple of moments to jot down some suggestions around each of those headings, if it, seeing as everyone has them. Uh, but then we'll mostly do that by discussion. But just for a moment, why don't we think about how are ways we could get around the typical problem of over-promising where we feel we have to say yes to everything. We get asked to do things, particularly uh, as an early career person. Um, <coughs> and even indeed, you know, um, as a somebody employed sessionally, that sort of creep around the edges of what you can be asked to do. So that over-promising and, and particularly... Well, it is active at all stages of a career. Yeah, it's active very much for people who are hoping to get a, a continuing academic position. If you have to say yes to everything because you need every possible thing on that CV. So I think that over-promising is a, a problem at any stage. A uh, second problem that everyone would recognise is email, not only how to deal with it, but um, how to avoid some of its kind of social collegial pitfalls, intellectual pitfalls as well. Mm -hmm. The double-edged swords are things that we probably all have some investment in. We do have some investment in a sense of vocation, in wanting to do the best we can, in feeling we should go the extra mile and so on, but it's also a vehicle for exploitation. So it's a double-edged sword. And likewise, productivity. Well, you know, we do want to be productive. We like what we do um, and we know we have to be productive um, to get a job or to keep a job. So it's a game you have to buy into, but how can we do that as productively as possible? And then the last one, <clears throat> pardon me, strategies that we've seen or thought about or could envisage um, that might actually cultivate a couple of really important qualities like collegiality and indeed joy. I'm not going to be uh, <laughs> afraid to say joy. So why don't we take a few moments just to note down on the, the paper or on your screen uh, anything that speaks to you from the double-edged swords, the problems or the... Um, cultivating the positives, and then we'll do all this as a shared discussion. Hi, everyone, again. Um, so let's take it from the top and hear what people had to say about um, strategies for tackling over-promising, the feeling that we have to say yes to everything. Anyone have something to contribute? One of my ones. Sorry. No, go for it. Why can't I? Like it. Hi, um, I should say I'm Megan. Um, one of the strategies I've had, because I think that you need to be very self-disciplined uh, and self-determined and, and managing kind of boundaries, but I find it useful to have a mentor um, myself and to also use, I'm doing my doctorate, use my supervisors to help me maintain boundaries and prioritise. Sometimes it's easier to say no when you're being told you really should say no, it's going to be too much work. <laughs> but then I feel like, okay, far right. But because you did think about that and what else you've got to do, it's just a bit easier to say no at that point. Mm. Mm. You can use them as a bad cop too, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, I really would help, but my supervisor will be just <laughs> furious if I do that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and Katrina, I might just point out, I'm sure you saw on the chat earlier, she she um, pointed out helpfully that there's some resources about mentoring that you say are, are really helpful. So we, anyone who wants to look at that about mentoring, that sounds great. Thank you for sharing that. Cool. Karen, thanks. Uh, one of the things I kind of try and follow is for every um, two things I agree to, I have to say no to the first. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always work, but it's just, you know, like just actually keeping a bit of a watch on that. And then I also, um, if someone's asked me something big, I say I, that I um, need to think about it overnight mm -hmm. because, um, just, you know, talking, saying yes or no too soon, I think um, having a really good think helps us to say no. Mm -hmm. So that's one of my other strategies. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that point about mentoring is really, really important because we don't automatically know what it's good to say no to mm. initially. Mm. And I had a few examples when I started out that I 
really, I said no to because I was really mindful of, you know, I had a really heavy teaching load to start. And I, I didn't see how physically I actually had time to do things, so I said no. But strategically, I should have prioritised some other things and actually said yes to those things. And so I think that's where mentoring or collegial support or um, just asking the question, you know, going to someone and saying, hey, I've got these two things. I don't know whether to say yes to or no to. I really haven't got time, but I could prioritise. What do you think I should do? You know, I think that's really important as well. Yeah, and I think that maybe sort of links into the, the, the playing the games, mm -hmm. you know, just being, some, some of it is strategic, ticking a box because it's some career move versus doing something because it is actually satisfying and rewarding. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes those things are not aligned. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, making those decisions is really difficult, particularly you know, for, for confirmation path people where there are lots of boxes that tick. must be ticked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, there's a cat. <laughs> Simone's cat. Um, <laughs> anyone else on over promising? I think just even I'd say just even starting from the premise that you are allowed to say no to certain things. I mean, there are without being uh, naive about certain constraints, particularly for people um, on confirmation pathways, of course. But you know, there are uh, there are all those personality, gender you know, all those social demographic reasons why some people are much better at saying no than others. Yes. <laughs> so we can politicise that question about saying no too. There's also ways of saying no. Um, <laughs> so I had an experience not very long ago where I um, agreed with somebody that we were going to say no to a book chapter that we were really interested in, that would have been really cool to be involved in, but we had all these other writing projects that we needed to get on with in very limited time and a heavy year. So we said no, we decided to say no. And I wrote the email and I said um, that scheduling at the moment means that this is just impossible for us, so we have to say no. And of course I left it wide open for her to come back and say, but we can change the scheduling. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not how you say no. <laughs> but also conversely, that, does, that, that makes us realise that it's not just a yes-no question too. Mm. Your reply can be, I would love not to yet. do that, but I've got this, this and this. What support could you give me? Or how can mm. we make this possible? Or could I not do that bit but do this bit so yeah, that's another uh, mm. side of that and very occasionally you can be surprised I, I was remember feeling very assertive once I'm not good at saying no and said mm. said no to something where it was ju it was just a media interview a radio interview but it was going to be a very long one and uh, I had a new baby and they wanted me to you know come an hour from my home at night time for several hours in the studio to do this thing while somebody else was you know and I was thinking starting to think oh well and if someone came in and they could do and then I thought this is ridiculous. And I just said, no, no, I can't do that. I'm really sorry. And then they go, oh, would you like us to send a sound recorders to your house? And it's like, oh, <laughs> gosh. <laughs> if I'd known that sometimes when you say no, people actually have a backup strategy, I could have used that info 30 years earlier. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think those, the kind of politics of one's personality and how you respond are worth thinking about, noticing that there are some people who don't have any trouble saying no to certain kinds of things and so on. Mm. Uh, email. <laughs> Anyone, any, can anyone solve it for us very quickly? What do you do about email? <laughs> Somebody must have some tips. We, we all know we need to turn it off, but <laughs> just, I don't know. We, we had this discussion earlier about email and, and yeah, like you can give that advice to say at certain times of the day, turn it off. But sometimes a task that you're working on requires you to go into your email to do a thing on your to-do list and, and you're in, you're in. <laughs> and you can't get <laughs> <And> out. disappear. <laughs> and, yeah. I don't know. It's, that is hard. I, I, I'd said to a colleague about a week ago that I don't actually need a to-do list. I just need to open my inbox. Yeah. It just comes in at you. And um, I, that, that is a massive struggle. I don't know if anyone has found a solution I, I just check it once a day mainly um, and, and you know, even have if there's something else I'm working on, I've been gone, you know, a couple of days without checking my email. My world has not ended. Like I've had <laughs> anxiety <laughs> feeling in the pit of my stomach that possibly there's something really, you know, drastic has happened and I'm totally unaware. But mostly, um, I mean, you, some people probably find it frustrating that I don't reply as promptly as other people. But I'm, I'm living with that. <laughs> yep. 
feel if I don't reply, my students and my colleagues come looking for me and it takes far more time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can't get them out of the down. office. <laughs> I think one thing, uh, 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 when, when Karen says that her world didn't end, I, I, it makes me think there would be parts of my departmental world that would end if one didn't answer straight away. And that makes me think about how one can be a good colleague on email to others. If people send things on a weekend saying, you know, we're giving out supervisions here for honours, you know, la, 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 la. Of course you start to, if this happens routinely, you start to feel, well, I have to check all the time or things will be happening without me or, and so on. So I think we can also think about how we can be a good email colleague to others. Um, and um, if, 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 because there's that thing, once you've sent the email, you feel your job is done, but you've just landed something on someone else. So it, <laughs> it, part of one's own managing strategies can be to do it whenever it happens to suit. I really wish there was an Outlook um, thing that could time your release of your email because sometimes I'll, I'll be doing work at a random time and so I'll kind of need to send that because I won't remember to do it two hours you know two days later or whatever yeah. but I wish I could just kind of release it yeah. at 9 a.m the next morning yeah. or yeah. you know you, you but, can because you can work offline this is one of the straight I was just talking to myself before about, about this about how you know I have all these ideas for how to manage email and do Karen's trick of only checking it once a day but I never do I always <laughs> fall back into old habits whatever anyway um, the other thing is just to work offline and do your emails all offline and then as soon as you go online maybe when you get to work the next morning all of it goes out then Oh, and so you can you can sort of limit the interactions with students so they're not at 11 o'clock at night or whenever you do happen to be doing that, that, that catching up on emails or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't look like you're encouraging mm -hmm. your accessibility after hours. I know, it's yeah. Sort of, yeah, I'm so there's very that. clear with students and colleagues. I show a picture of my three-year-old daughter at the first part of lectures. <laughs> <and> say, <laughs> this is her time. This will be a time. After hours and weekends. Yeah, are you, I'm not on the computer. Mm. I do not want her to grow up seeing me. Yeah, she does not know how to use an iPhone. <laughs> even though I have one, she doesn't know what it is. She thinks it's a camera. <laughs> <laughs> so even though I cheat sometimes and do do it, like after she's gone to sleep, that I think at least gives me always something to fall back on my own personal ethics. That I do not be ruled by email after hours. Students can get me nine to five, five days a week. That's plenty of time. Mm. And they need to think about how they wouldn't expect other businesses That's right. to email them back after hours. So why would they expect us to be constantly on email <laughs> doing that? Mm. Wow, that, that's, I mean, there's a certain kind of discipline there and there's a certain rejection of, it's, it's so much about temporality, isn't it? And about time and there's a, uh, a willed rejection then of certain kind of temporal pressures. Well done. Yeah, it's sort of linked to that. Um, there, we were just sort of saying in our group earlier, I think because of the immediacy of email, there's an assumption that the response is also going to be yeah. immediate. And, and I, I have to say to students that our department is not a call centre. <laughs> you know, it's not, we're just not just sitting there filtering um, responses. And sometimes we need time to think about the response before we can actually give it. And and, and that has seemed to, to stem the flow somewhat. But, but I think people do assume you're going to respond ASAP. Yeah, so I guess it is, it's just setting those boundaries. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. What about, I can see as, as time ticks on, we will, um, which of the um, remaining ones would you like to focus on? We can talk maybe about productivity, is that a useful one to talk about? Or do you want to talk about joy and collegiality? <laughs> Yes. Positive. Yeah, okay, why don't we do that? So <laughs> tell us what you've seen or can think up or have witnessed or have done that cultivates. We might put them in, they're not the same thing, but uh, for reasons of time, we might put collegiality and joy Always. As, <laughs> in one love category. Tell us what you've seen. You had a great one. Um, my department went through management of change last year, so we obviously had a very negative experience with academia for a while and one of the ways that I kept reminding myself of what I enjoyed about it was um, my daughter comes to work every day to pick me up and she always asks me how was my day and I get the chance to talk to her about all the good things that happen um, whether it's good feedback from students or we found something really fun in um, in research or something but it always makes 
reminds you of you chose this for a career, you do it for particular reasons, and there is a lot of a lot of fun things I get to do every single day. So but you don't want to tell her the crap stuff, you want to tell her the great stuff, and that reminds you of what the great stuff was. So she thinks being an academic is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> What else? I think you have to, oh, sorry. I think sometimes you have to learn to, um, sometimes there is someone in the your sphere who's having a really hard time being an academic, and sometimes, and that's quite easy for everyone to kind of get sucked into this vortex of misery. And um, <laughs> you have to learn how to manage that without, um, without, Sort of cutting them off, but you have to not get sucked into that. Um, mm -hmm. this, that way lies badness. <laughs> I'm just going to share a couple of things that my department does. Uh, one is we have a good news bulletin, <laughs> which is um, a semi regular email, which is where you just share uh, some good news, whether it's publications or a half marathon, whatever it may, whatever it may be, just like a woohoo kind of an email. And that's that's that breaks up the dirge of, of, of emails of whether it's events, requests, or bad news. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's, that's very positive. And the other thing we do, we have a lot of um, strong connections with a uh, university in Uppsala in Sweden. And so we, we've been inspired by the Swedish Fika. And so every Friday morning for about 20 minutes, um, someone will predominantly home bake, but if not go to the supermarket and we'll take it in turns. And we just have a bit of a coffee morning for about 20 minutes with some muffins or something. Mm -hmm. It's really simple stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, food. <laughs> Other things? One thing I'd want to say, one of the obstacles to this that I think we just have to smash through is um, the kind of tacit expectation that you shouldn't be happy or you shouldn't be well because that would show that you're not working hard enough. <laughs> um, I, th I find that really insidious. I find that very prevalent, this tacit expectation. If you've got time, just talk to someone, you're not working hard enough. What are you hiding if you're able to do things? And I, in my very, when I got my very first academic job, in the early 90s, and I was younger then, and you know, I, I socialised a lot with the postgrads because they were way more fun than the <laughs> colleagues I had. Um, and I did a six week, one night a week, like two hours course, because I was in a new city, I didn't know anyone, lead lighting, like at a community college for six weeks or something. And I told one of the postgrads this, and I was in the office one morning and, and uh, she came in and she started to ask me how it was and then a senior professor walked in she started to say how was lead lighting and she went how is uh, LL because the professor worked here and she was protecting <laughs> my reputation by hiding from the professor the fact that I was doing this tiny lead lighting course and the expectation that you're not supposed to have uh, a, a life, life outside <laughs> is absolutely insidious it's quite sick and I think we have to really reject that and I um, sent some of my colleagues a picture of myself last semester in a very bad wig and a 19th century costume because I decided I was going to go in a musical last semester <laughs> and it was just it was a bit pressured towards because production was at the end of semester it was a bit pressured but I've got to say I have a whole new cast of characters in my head <laughs> and in terms of being a better colleague to others because I'm not just thinking the same thoughts and mm. having the same world it helps you be a better colleague to others as well as have, having fun so have feel licensed to have fun I think is the important part it's not we all know how to have fun but feeling licensed to be a professional who's allowed to have fun <laughs> how weird is that that we have to be allowed to does that chime with anyone else's experiences of <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to say something um, in relation to that and what the other person said in, in Otago is that, that we, we, yeah, we make the effort, not so consistently, but make the effort to have like socializing moments and, you know, especially with a group of early, early career, um, mostly females, you know, with them. But I found, I found that it's really positive and it really helps a lot to um, be happier and, um, and feel like you're being cared of for, you know. But we always tend to fall into, you know, nagging mode. And I think that's also, I mean, I think there's a space for that and I think it's really important to do that and we get to 
know what others are going through and you know see the person as for the systematic you know see what you know okay so you having problem with that person we all have problems with that you know but you know it, it it's like we bond in commiserate <laughs> you know we bond in in and i find that i mean it's useful to a certain degree but it, it will be good to, to go over that and and go to the productive thing you know to the to do something really awesome together instead of always kind of being in this side kind of criticizing i don't know if it makes sense but but they, uh, there's also joy in doing that in a way but mm. but it kind of reinforces some negative that we need to think about those negatives but yeah i don't know yeah mm. I completely agree with you, Marcella. I think um, combining that sense of collegiality with that sense of the possibility of joy with your colleagues is actually really important as well. So um, I've been involved, um, one of my more recent roles has been chairing a committee and um, for teaching and learning and we've brought together people to try and start thinking about our curriculum as a whole and do some review work and that sort of thing. And when I started doing it, I didn't know how to do it. So this is again learning on the job and trying to you know, find ways of getting people talking to each other and that sort of thing. Um, it was just about actually bringing people together in, in a, our department. We'd all been just going through the mill and not doing any of this collegial, getting together, talking about what we do and how we do it, that actually we had to do quite a bit of that before we could even get to the curriculum review stuff mm -hmm. because we were so out of practice of just kind of talking about different ideas as a collective and so having those moments those morning teas those um those events where we just talk to each other as as groups rather than just the individual colleagues who you happen to relate well with or you work with more closely actually you know the department as a whole i think that's really really important and even as early careers i think it's possible to initiate those in ways that perhaps your senior colleagues who are more uncultured <laughs> um actually can um and it's really appreciated so i think if you feel like that's not happening and you want it to happen do something like say to a few colleagues let's bring cake tomorrow and just have a morning tea or something i think that's really helpful yeah. Um, I saw there was a message from Katrina that came up. Is it there? Uh, yes, thank you Katrina, saying I think it's important to participate in exercises like this where we stop doing and reflect on the doing. Mm -hmm. Having these conversations helps us disrupt the norms and realise which are health and which are healthy and which are not. Some people are good at doing this sort of goal setting and reflecting individually, others need this sort of group exercises to create the time and space for it. It's so helpful, reorienting oneself for the next season. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's some, um, I mean, I've always, I, perhaps I romanticise the idea of the collegiality, because I, uh, the collegiate, because I know traditionally it was in exclusive and hierarchical and so on. But it also, I think, is the best thing about being an academic, mm. is that you meet these people, you meet them virtually, you meet them by email, you feel you know people across the world, you share the basic precepts that talking about things matters, yeah. that ideas matter, that students matter. You differ and may fight on all the nitty gritty of stuff. Some of them may drive you to distraction, but they do. Um, some of them can be toxic and all of that. But we have this, international uh, network of people that we can uh, that we're part of and I do think that is one of the great um, privileges of academic life so I've been really uh, lucky to be part of this one today and I think it's exactly right Sophie what you're saying about if you want things to happen you can build very small scale ones in just by thinking of them and going hey how about we all do this so thank you <laughs> thank you thank you that's great right. thanks okay. thank you <laughs> Thanks so much, Rita. I think that's a really you know, upbeat note to, to end on, you know, the feeling mm. licensed to have fun and that this is not <laughs> indulgent. It's actually <laughs> part of, of the surviving and thriving. So, so thanks very much to everybody for, for joining. And I've just noticed there's obviously also seven non-video participants. So those of you who we can't see on the screen, thank you so much for, for coming in as well. Um, thanks to the other campuses. I think it's been a fantastic discussion and, and we hope to see you in some of the other early career and postgrad um, seminars that we, that we have. Sorry, so I was just going to say it's also being recorded. So for those of you who know people who have left, then um, uh, let them know it's, it's recorded and it'll be on the ESOCSI website as well as the resources that Ruth's put together. 
Wonderful. Right. Thanks. Thanks so Thank much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for all for coming.